Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Van Mersbergen, and this is my third presentation for the Vintage Computer Festival in Midwest. Uh, today, it's about, uh, well, from Next to the Sphere, the beginning, story of uh, the beginning, very beginnings of Nexa Corporation and their eventual merger to become the, uh, Sphere Inc., which more people may have heard of. First, let's start with Nexa Corporation. Well, it was incorporated on June 24th, 1982 by Gilman Louie and a few of his college friends. And the name was based on a department at San Francisco State University that was a combination of the humanities and the sciences. And it was run out of a back room in Gilman's parents' house. I want to be clear on that. It was not a garage-based company. It was a back room-based company. And the first game they produced here, Captain Cosmo by Greg Omi. Notice they got a P.O. box there because, once again, they operated out of, a, out of a house, so they didn't want stuff going there, obviously. There's Captain Cosmo there. It's a scrolling arcade game starring Captain Cosmo, hero of the universe. He's out to save the world from the munchies they escaped from the zoo. This is the Atari version. And there we, there we see our hero right there, attempting to recapture some munchies. That came out early in 82. Next, we have Delta Squadron. It's a strategic space war simulation for the Apple II. And it was programmed by Gim and Louie himself. And it's mostly strategy-based, but the main premise of it is to take your fighter to skim down a trench and attack it. Wait a minute. This sounds awfully familiar to something else, I think. Uh, Gilman, I think there's a Mr. Lucas who might want to discuss something with you about this game. And at this time also, Nexa Corporation started programming for the MSX computer in Japan. They started first by porting Captain Cosmo. They were published by ASCII Corporation in Japan. Uh, Brian Fong and Gilman Louie uh, translated uh, Greg Omi's game for the MSX computer. And graphically... Looks a little bit better. Our hair is a little bit more defined, and the munchies look completely different. But it played about the same. And they also came up with Starship Simulator, which is written by Gilman himself again and published by ASCII Corporation. Basically, kind of like Space Shuttle, but not as complicated. And then we have F-16 Fighter, or known as F-16 Fighting Falcon in, this, in the U.S., although uh, Nexa did the MSX version, not any of the other versions. And you fly the F-16 Fighting Falcon, the most advanced jet fighter in the world. And there's a title screen by ASCII. And Les Watts programmed this, this game for the MSX. And graphically, I think that's pretty impressive there for the MSX right there. Got the 3D element there and all the control panels. Standard flight sim, pretty much. At, at this time, they actually wrote a programming manual for the MSX. They figured that the MSX was going to come to the U.S. and companies might need to know how to program it since they learned how to program it pretty well. And all the programmers contributed to it. But uh, as we all know, the MSX did not come here. And that book has been, been, since been lost. Uh, no one remembers what happened to it. But they put a lot of work into it and it just never materialized. At this time, though, they started developing a football simulation game. And uh, Epix was in contact with them. They really, really wanted their football game. And they paid them a lot of money to acquire it. And we all know it as the world's greatest football game. In name only. Anybody who's played it <laughs> will know that it is not, unfortunately. We have the Commodore 64 version. It was programmed by Greg Omi. He did a lot of the Commodore versions for, for Nexa. And there's your title screen with the game designed by Nexa Corporation. They designed and programmed this game for Epix. Epix just uh, distributed and sold it. That's the Commodore screenshot there. And we also had an Apple II version programmed by Leonard Chan. There's the Apple title screen there. And the gameplay screen, black and white, not color. 
And of course, we have Ace of Aces, published by Accolade. Nexo worked on the IBM PC port of this game, not the others, but I'm imagining you all are familiar with this game. It was a very good game on the Commodore and the Atari as well. It's a first-person 2D flight sim simulation. And the IBM PC version was programmed by Billy Sociono. And it looks pretty good on the PC. They used the EGA graphics. This is the EGA upgrade version. The CJ1, I can't even look at. <laughs> I don't know how they played games on the IBM and CGA in those days. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> but EGA, as you can see, is so much better. So much better. Now it comes to the most interesting game and one of my personal all-time favorites that Nexa created. Uh, it's a game uh, called Portal. And the story is, where are all the humans? Upon returning from your 100-year voyage in the Milky Way, you find Earth empty and abandoned. Between the decaying remnant of civilization, you discover a terminal for WorldNet, the global network that recorded all human activities. The answer must lie deeper in its database. Anxious, you log on. Basically, Portal's not an adventure game per se. It's more like a, a, it's a computer novel. Because the more you progress, the more systems you open up, you get more tidbits of the story and find out what happened to humanity. And the AI in the system called Homer notices you log in, and it also wants to know what happened, because it's been decades since anyone's logged into the system. So it's a pretty, pretty, very, very, very interesting game and one of my all-time favorites. And they ported it to the Apple II version, programmed by anyone? No, Leonard Chan. You got to pay attention earlier. Be a quiz later. And there's your title screen, 86. It was written by author Rob Swaggart. Wrote the story for, for Portal. It's a pretty good story. And program on Nexacorp. They also did uh, some of the design. Uh, Rob collaborated with Nexa, the Nexa programmers to create the interface and the overall structure of the game. And there's the Apple II interface. This one used your joystick to scroll around to the 12 different categories you could look at and with the information in the bottom. And when you clicked on one, you got a little text box there. This priority three message from Ezekiel Fortune, December, November of 2093. And we have the Commodore 64 version, programmed by Greg Omi, the resident Commodore programmer. And again, a little bit different resolution, but there's a Commodore version. It also used the same interface that the Apple did, using your joystick to scroll around to the 12 different categories. And the text on uh, white on purple, pretty easy to read. Mr. Mr. Fortune there again. And they also released an IBM PC version, programmed by Arianto Widodo. And there's your CGA graphics in all their glory. And again, the IBM also used the same interface as the Apple and Commodore versions, where you scroll around with the joystick to the different categories. Or you could also use, as I said here, the ancient keyboard interface, which is still in use well into the 2030s. Text is pretty easy to read on the IBM to the, the high resolution for text. But now we get into, I guess, the next-gen computer versions of, of Portal, probably, and some of the best versions of it. The Commodore Amiga version, programmed by... Our Anton Wijaja. There's a title screen there. More definition in the graphics there and the colors. And the interface here, this to me is the ideal interface to play Portal on. It uses a mouse interface, and you see all 12 categories on your screen, and you click around and use the mouse to navigate and scroll, and it really is a much better experience playing it on the Amiga as opposed to the Commodore, Apple, and IBM versions. As you can see with the higher resolution the Amiga, the text is very easy to read. And it is, there's a lot of text in this game. And it's usually a good benefit to, to be able to read it. Bring this too. There was also an Apple Macintosh version. Now, for years, people thought that this version did not exist, that it wasn't developed or was developed and just not released. But uh, a few years ago, a guy in the Macintosh garden actually found a retail copy of it and was able to image the discs and share it with us. And it turns out to be, it's, it's my favorite version of the game, as it turns out. The Macintosh version of Portal, programmed by Thomas Hughes. This is, to, to me, it's a masterpiece of Mac programming. He did a very good job on it. 
But uh, he had a little trouble integrating the Mac OS into his program because it's the, the mouse control is native to the OS. And uh, I was told lots of stories by the former Next people of him throwing his mouse in disgust and cursing up a storm because he couldn't get it to work the way he wanted to. But ultimately, he got it done. But the Apple Mac version had a bit of a compatibility problem when it did come out. It was written for the Macintosh 512K and the Macintosh Plus. When the SE came out, it wouldn't run on the SE. I think that may have been a contributing factor to why that, that retail copy is so rare today. People bought it. It didn't work. They returned it. You know, they, didn't, they didn't do that. But I found a quote here in a book. The first hypertext novel, Rob Swaggart's Portal, was designed for that year's Macintosh. A few months later, the new model appeared, and Swaggart couldn't even run his own novel. <laughs> That's the story. He, the guy who authored the game couldn't run it on his new Mac. That's from uh, Preview 2001 Plus, Popular Cultural Studies in the Future. Pretty good read. There's the title screen of the Mac version. Very, very sharp uh, monochrome graphics. Looks very good. And notice the additional copyright date of 1987, which does indicate that this version was probably released later. All the others were released in 1986. And that's Corporation fully spelled out, and the other ones, they abbreviated it, even though they had the space in the Amiga. And look at that. That's just amazing, isn't it? Easy to read, monochrome graphics. Again, you use the Apple mouse to scroll around. The sound effects on the Mac are probably the best the, the game has. I highly recommend uh, playing this version of the game. You can get it from the Macintosh Garden. Use the mini VMAC emulator in 1x mode. Otherwise, it might go. the game will crash if it runs too fast. We think there's something in the game regarding the speed and the timing. And I think if you run on it, does, it also works on the Mac Classic, by the way, too. It does work on the Mac Classic, but not on any other Mac. Plus, 512K and Mac Classic run it, and Minivi Mac can run it in that mode. And perfectly clear text there. And Homer looks more like Homer <laughs> down there in the corner. Very easy to read. And, of course, the Atari ST version, which was being programmed by Elizabeth Kong. Now, this one, we do believe, was probably not finished, or, or, or we're pretty sure it was started, because they remember that uh, she was having some trouble programming it, and also she was having some trouble getting proper documentation from Atari on how to program the ST, which doesn't surprise me all, all that much regarding what was going on at Atari at that time. So I did reach out to Elizabeth. Unfortunately, uh, she did not respond. So I don't have any tales to, to give you about the Atari development of the Atari ST version. Only is I do hope we find it. We can only speculate on what interface style it would have used, but I would imagine it would have used the Amiga style interface as most ST games did mimic that and use the mouse interface which the ST had. Hopefully one day we'll find we'll be able to show you that version as well. I think there's hope out there that it might be out there. And the reason we think that is because of the loading instructions. Notice all the versions are here, including the Mac one, which we thought didn't exist, and the Atari ST one is right down there too. With loading instructions. So maybe maybe it is out there to be found. We'll have to, we'll have to see. And the game came with this fantastic map of the world administrative regions showing all the changes that took place. Look at Chicago's a dome city up there. Antarctica doesn't look like it changed all that much. Now there's something I'm actually curious about. This card was in the box with Portal. I guess it's kind of a hint book type for Portal. It's called a guide to Portal to help you find your way. Um... I cannot find a copy of this anywhere. I don't know if anybody ordered one or bought one from Activision. If you have it, uh, I would love a PDF copy if anybody can find it. I'm just curious as to what it actually was. I really don't know. Uh, some years later, Rob Swagger published it as a book called Portal, A Data Space Retrieval, which includes all the text from the game and some extra text that he put in there uh, for the novel. Although I do recommend uh, playing the game before you read the novel because it probably spoils the experience for you if you do it that way. Bring us to 1987. In 1987, Nexa merged with Spectrum Holobyte to create Sphere Inc. Now, at the time of the merger, both companies, both Nexa and Spectrum Holobyte, continued to release products under their own names. So I'm guessing due to uh, probably contractual obligations and the nature of them not figuring out what they're going to do quite yet. So they continued to operate as separate entities, even though they were merged together for a couple of years. 
Bring us to L.A. Crackdown. I liked this game when it came out. I played it on my Commodore. Uh, you play a cop basically staking out a warehouse to gather evidence to break up a drug ring. Pretty standard, right? And the action is controlled by monitors in a surveillance van. You control a rookie officer. He assists you by searching rooms, planting bugs, and even interrogating suspicious characters. But watch out, though. He actually learns from experience that can help you make decisions or may disobey orders if he disagrees with the decision. I mean, if you try to force him to do something he doesn't want to do, he'll up and quit on you. So don't make an arrest before you have the proper evidence. We have the Apple II version. And it was programmed by anyone? Was it? Is it Leonard Chan I heard out there? Uh, not by himself. It's Leonard Chan and Clifford Yap. He joined uh, Mex at that point. There's a title screen for the Apple version. It's very colorful. No, they made use of colors on there. And that's the first screen you see there. As you try to pick your rookie officer, he's got a receiver attached behind his ear and how you communicate with him. And there's the game screen there. You got your two monitors there showing the warehouse there and different areas you can send them to and the status of your bugs. You can plant bugs in any room, bug any phone, so you can find out what's going on in there. And we have the Commodore 64 version, which is programmed by... No. Same two guys. <laughs> I think Greg had left Nexa by that point. He actually started working for Epix, although he thought he would take a break from the gaming industry for a while, but uh, they recruited him almost right away. So, And this Commodore version is not as colorful as the Apple version. It's a little, uh, little, little washed out there a little bit, in my, my, my opinion. I mean, it does look good, but the Apple version is a bit more colorful. And again, there's your screen there where you control your rookie and send them to different places and plant your bugs. And of course, they reached an IBM PC version, programmed by Arianto Widodo. Yeah, there's your beautiful CGA graphics for you, buddy, right there. There you go. As I said, I feel I felt bad for the people playing PC games in this era. You must have had a pair of 3D glasses or something. It's that shade of pink just gets you after a while. <laughs> but again, same screens. You got the monitor, and he's wearing uh, forever wearing a blue shirt, I guess. <laughs> and, the, and the warehouse has pink filing cabinets. <laughs> so now the interesting thing about this game, I needed the hint book to solve this game because it was very difficult to do. But reading that, you find out that all three versions had different ways to get to solve the case. So if you had a friend there, the Apple version, you had the Commodore version, you had the PC version, and you tried to collaborate to solve the case. You couldn't do it because the paths are different. I think they did that intentionally <laughs> to isolate you a little bit more. If you had the same version, then you could. But all three versions had slightly different variations of the solution. I found that fascinating. When I looked at the hint book. I'm like, whoa, what? <laughs> that changed really quickly. IBM version, this happens now, but the counter version happens two days later. Then uh, the next one went on. They got some contracts to make some games for Sega for their master system. And these are the two last games that Nexa Corporation actually put their name on as Nexa Corporation. First is Monopoly, the Mega Plus cartridge. It's an early licensed version of, of the classic. It supports up to 10 players because you have up to 10 tokens in the game. And any number of them can be controlled by the computer. So you could have two real players and eight computer players. So you can have a pretty good game. And this was programmed by Bill Chow, Jin DePan, Kevin Segetti, and Scott Stanton. There's your title screen. It's looking pretty good. There's one of the game screens there. The cool thing about this game is that the, the pieces were animated. The hat floats above, the dog runs along the path, the train runs along the ground. It's actually, it's actually pretty cool to watch. And uh, when they finished programming the game, they put an Easter egg in it. Now, according to programmer Kevin Segetti, because the game was published by Sega, they would not permit them to put credits in the game. So they had to remove them. Or at least hide them. So to make the, the, the Easter egg appear, you pause the game, press buttons 1 and 2 and down in the down direction all at once. Then press down again to see some secret messages from the developers. Each button on the D-pad takes you to a different message. But I've done the hard work for you, and I can show you what the screens look like. 
uh, project leader, R. Anton Wajaja. We've seen his name before. Bill Chow, Jin Japan, Kevin Segetti, and Scott Stanton, assisted by Dan Gura and Tim Dunn. And Kevin put a message in there. Well, I hope he got, uh, he got some kudos for that, I hope. And also for Jenny and Elisa. And then Bill Chow decided to put his uh, signature on it. <laughs> yeah. Anyone ever try to call that number? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, Sega found out about the Easter egg in there, and they were annoyed of that, and they removed it later. Now, you can actually tell which version you have. You have match system games, which one has the Easter egg and which one doesn't, just by looking at the cartridge. This one has the Easter egg, which is Monopoly. The fixed version is Monopoly, as it should be. I don't know why the differentiation in labels, but the first one has the Easter egg, the second one doesn't. My copy has the Easter egg, so I'm happy with that. And then the second game they developed for Sega is probably the worst game for the Master System ever. Yes, um, based on that lovable character, Alf. The goal of this game is to help Alf try to get to Mars to see his friends Skip and Rhonda. It takes him out of the Tanner household and into suburbia, the depths of subterranean caves, the bottom of the lake, and even the moon. As he looks for parts to build his space scooter, however, he's constantly hunted by the ATF, uh, the alien task force, who will stop at nothing to keep Alf from reaching his goal. However, Alf is not completely defenseless. He can buy and trade for items that'll keep him out of sight and away from their clutches, and he can get his ultimate weapon, the sausage. That's your only weapon in the game. A sausage you get out of the refrigerator. This was programmed by Kevin Segetti and Jin Japan, and they have since apologized for it, <laughs> at least to me. <laughs> there he is. Look, Alf is even shocked he's in this game. And there's your gameplay screen there. Now, the, uh, what you're supposed to do here is you're supposed to grab the cat and open the refrigerator and get the sausage. Took me two weeks to figure that out. And the sausage is your only weapon in the game. You hit things with it. He doesn't eat the cat, though, which is odd. You, th you thought that he you, you, would, you would think that he would. Anyway, that brings us to the end of Nexa. The, the other products they would produce would be Sphere branded. And also, Spectrum. They, later on, they would change their name back to Spectrum Holobyte, and they'd publish games such as Falcon 3.0, which you might have seen, uh, Star Trek Next Generation, The Final Unity, and, and they went on from there. But... Uh, I think they did pretty good in the early days. They actually released some pretty good games. Portal, really good. LA Crackdown, really good. Um, Monopoly's pretty good. Elf, not so good. Um, so, <laughs> but, but there you have it there. It was his little consulting company that uh, he parlayed and merged with another company and got bigger and bigger. Gilman always had his eye on the future. Uh, he's a very successful individual, and he's very hard to track down. Once again, I reached out to him, but uh, he did not uh, respond, so I was not able to get his insight on Nexa Corporation. But I will give special thanks to Greg Omi, who responded to all my emails, all my chats, and all my video <laughs> interviews with him to pick his brain about Nexa Corporation. So at this point, I'll open it up to any questions anyone may have on anything I've covered. If anyone has any questions, please line up behind this uh, Q&A mic. <laughs> Okay, you can even ask me anything that's not relevant. Because <laughs> they give me a freaking headache. <laughs> that's why. Oh. oh, I said I feel bad for Abby and PC owners that had CGA. Do you have any info on the Spectrum Holobyte version of Tetris? Because that was my favorite. Um, Greg was gone by then. So he didn't have any insight on, onto that. I do know that um, I think they had the license to Tetris, as far as I know, for the computer version. But other than that, I don't uh, know much about that. I might do that in part two, where we cover Spectrum Holobyte. It, <laughs> used, the it used the best CGA palette, so no pink. Oh, did it? Yeah. Well, if, if they used handy graphics on some of these games, I think it would have helped it too. But uh, Portal and uh, LA Crackdown did not have tandy modes. And that would have helped, I think.
Is LA Crackdown the first game to actually have different solutions for different platforms? I've oh, never heard of that before. As far as I know, that was something they did on their own. They, they did that decided as a group that we're going to make it difficult for people who own different copies of the game. If they try to collaborate, it's not going to help them at all. Is so, it just that the days are different, the events happen in different uh, the, days? The timing of events are different, and some events happen in some versions of the games that don't happen in the others. Hmm. Like, what do you mean you found that body in the warehouse? I didn't find anything in the warehouse. I had the Apple II version. I never beat it. It was a little too hard yeah, for me. I had the counter version. So back then, if I knew you, I wouldn't be able to help you. A little too hard for my like, you know, 10, 12-year-old self, you know? Oh, yeah. It was very difficult. That's why I needed the hint book. And then when I got the hint book, I noticed that it went off to three different branches. Interesting. In the middle of the case, it goes off three different directions. That's very depending interesting. Depending on what version you have. It's just, wow, those guys really wanted to mess with us back then. <laughs> Indeed, they did. <laughs> pretty ingenious, though, actually, if you think about it. It's pretty ingenious. Diabolical, but pretty ingenious. Can I double dip questions? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> what do you remember? What you use guys use for uh, disc duplication? I believe they didn't do that themselves because all these games were published by other companies later on. Initially, I think they did. They created their own discs and it was sold pretty much through through mail order and through different stores in California. Do you guys have any kind of like floppy copy protection techniques? Um. I did ask Greg about that. He didn't remember much about that. And he had gotten rid of all of his floppies by the time I talked to him. So he didn't have any of his development tools anymore, which is kind of sad. But I do know that, uh, that what Portal Activision did a ZMAG uh, protection on that for the Commodore. Not sure what they did on the other ones, but they, usually the, the publishing companies would, would exact the protection. Yeah. I hated the copy protection on the Commodore 64 <laughs> version of LA Crackdown because it was beaten my drive mercilessly because it did the head slam every single time I'd access data. So... Yeah, that was not fun. Probably something fun on the last track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something there. It, it, I, I think it actually killed my first 1541. Thanks very much for the time. All right, no, no problem, guys. Enjoy the rest of the show. There's still time left. <laughs>